Father, I abandon myself to you. Do with me as you will. Whatever you may do with me, I thank you. I'm prepared for anything. I accept everything, provided your will is fulfilled in me and in all creatures. I ask for nothing more, my God. I place my soul in your hands. I give it to you, my God, with all the love of my heart, because I love you. Amen. You may be seated. First of all, for the remainder of the month of August, when you exit uh, the worship area, the sanctuary, in the foyer at that table where you picked up the communion uh, cups, there will be a special offering being taken place. Uh, it is for Darren and Lori Pankretz. It's in conjunction with the Nick Lillibird Open that will be taking place. And so if you want uh, more information about that, there's a piece of paper that's laying on the table about how you can give um, in other ways. But if you'd like to directly give through our offering basket, again, it's a separate basket in the back. Um, our prayer time, also if there's any other announcements that you want that are in the bulletin, please make sure you take a look in there. There are a few uh, located in there that you can find. Uh, this morning, our prayer time, just a couple of prayers that we have uh, received, and then it will open up for you, and that is that Rick did get results back from his testing, and so if you do not know at this point, he does have lung cancer, uh, and just at this time, is asking that you continue uh, to uh, lift him up in prayer. Rick, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, amen. Amen. Amen, okay. All right. Um, and then I also talked with Lori this week, and uh, she did have her multiple appointments, and her words to me basically were, God continues to provide her strength every day. And so uh, I was encouraged by her encouragement, uh, and we should continue to lift her up and Darren up in this time as well. Other prayer requests? I would like to say something. Okay. I was back there, I wasn't ready. Sure. <laughs> Uh, like you said, I had lung cancer. Uh, that was the only hot spot that they tested. They still kept me two other hot spots. Uh, what they told me, a surgery, I was out of question because uh, it's so far gone. I won't take chemo. I'll take radiation. But anyhow, I asked the doctor if I wouldn't do nothing, how long I had. At the max, and he said it told me a year. So I really haven't registered what, with all the stuff going on in my life, but God is still good. Oh, no matter how bad a day you guys have, you have to look for the small, joyful things in life. Because they're all around you. And it's just so amazing what God has created. And the love of people is just it's overwhelming to me because I've never felt love before. So, anyhow, my sister is Stephen. My sister gave me this book about a year ago when my sister dad had a cancer. And I mean, it's a daily book. So, I'd just like to read something out of it <laughs> if I can do it without breaking up. And if I can breathe it. <laughs> As you listen to birds calling to one another, hear also my love call to you. I speak to you continually through sights, sounds, thoughts, impressions, scriptures. There is no limit to the variety of ways I can communicate with you. Your part is to be attentive to my messages, in whatever form they come. When you set out to find me in a day, 
You discover that the world is pleasurably alive with my presence. You can find me not only in beauty and bird calls, but also in tragedy and faces filled with grief. I can take the deepest sorrow and weave it into a pattern for good. Search for me and my messages as you go through this day. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole being. And I wish everybody in the world things like that. Life would be so nice. But believe me, the Lord has been so good to me and your prayers are appreciated. So that's all I ask. Prayers. And your love, of course. Because you're sure I'm not in all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? My friend Wayne um, was was doing better. They thought he really declined this week um, to the point they took him out of intensive care and have transitioned him back home to Wilmer. Um, and he's in his final hours of life. Anyone else? Uh, the Lighthouse Church in Litchfield, uh, we used to attend there. This past week, their pastor suddenly died, uh, assuming it was a heart attack. So um, that family has grown children, but they had also adopted two grandchildren. So there's two young children um, in the home and a small congregation. So just prayers for the family and that congregation. Okay, well, I'll open it up to you for prayer, and then I will close. Heavenly Father, we think about the challenges that uh, are placed before us in this life, the trials. Uh, sometimes we struggle to understand why they are set before us, Lord, but your word has told us that it is through these trials, as hard as they may be, uh, that you refine us, Lord, that you grow us, and and you teach us in that through those difficult times, Lord, I think specifically of of Rick and his uh, learning officially that he has lung cancer. Lord, I just uh, lift him up in our prayers this week as we we know the difficulty, uh, the battles uh, that we face with cancer. Lord, we also think of Lori. Uh, she continues her fight uh, against against cancer as well, but Lord. But we are uplifted and encouraged by the fact that uh, in the midst of this, they can still see that you are walking with them side by side, Lord, that through this, uh, you are providing them a, a testimony, Lord, of faith, that uh, regardless of our circumstances, you promise to be with us always. Lord, I think of Paula's friend Wayne, and, and uh, again, the difficulties of, of uh, the final hours, Lord, for the family um, and friends, those who are uh, mourning for um, the health and the return, Lord, but also knowing that uh, their time is short, Lord. We think of the the pastor at Lighthouse Church, uh, that kind of mentioned, Lord, that uh, again, when tragedies like these strike, we are often left with little to say, Lord, and, and all we can offer is uh, hope and encouragement and, and the knowledge that uh, they will be, they are, will, are or will be with you here um, shortly, Lord. I just pray that you will be with you those of us that are around and have connection with the individuals mentioned, that we can uh, continue to offer hope and encouragement to walk alongside them faithfully, to cry with them, um, to sympathize with them, Lord, just to be present in their lives. Father, I uh, pray your blessing on this service today. Uh, Lord, let your spirit shine through in the words that are said. In your name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to shift into a time of confession.
So I'm going to uh, read a little something and then I'm going to ask that you take some time individually, quietly to pray and then I will close the time again with prayer. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our sins and not to conceal them in the presence of God our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a penitent and obedient heart so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought always to humbly admit our sins before God, but chiefly when we meet together to give thanks for the benefits that we have received at his hands, to offer praise that is due to him, and to hear his holy word. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of our gracious God and pray together. Please take a couple of moments silently and come before our great and merciful God and confess the sins that you have to him. Father, we, lo we lower our heads before you as we confess that we have too often lived as though we are not yours. Sometimes we carry on in our lives as if, as if there was no God, and we fall short of being a credible witness for you. For these things we ask for forgiveness. Give us clear minds and open our hearts so that we may give witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us tightly to you. Strengthen our relationship with you and with those you have given us on earth. Amen. Today we gather to partake in the Lord's Supper. In Christ, we can come before God with freedom and without fear. We can do this because of our faith in Christ. Remember that in the past, you were without Christ. You had no hope and did not know God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you are brought near to God through the blood of Christ's death. He did this with his death on the cross. You were bought but not with something that ruins like gold or silver. You were bought with the precious blood of the death of Christ, who was a pure and perfect lamb. God was pleased for all of himself to live in Christ. God made peace by using the blood of Christ's death on the cross. He brings you before God as people who are holy, who will accuse, who will accuse the people that God has chosen? No one. God is the one that makes them right. Who can say that God's people are guilty? No one. You have been born again. This new life did not come from something that dies, but from something that cannot die. God is in the light. We should live in the light too. If we live in the light, we share fellowship with each other. And when we live in the light, the blood of the death of Jesus is making us clean from every sin. Jesus is the way our sins are taken away. At this time, I've asked Jeff to pray for the bread. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we can all gather. Thank you for allowing your son to be bruised and beaten on our behalf. I ask that we will all be mindful of what you've done in your precious name. On the night Jesus was handed over to be killed, he took the bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke the bread and said, This is my body. It is for you. Do this to remember me. And 
and also has Layton to pray over the cup. Father, we just thank you for what you have done for us, each of us, by sending your Son, Jesus, to the cross to die for our sins. Every one of our sins, uh, not one, has been uh, taken care of by ourselves. Only you uh, can cover the multitude of sins that this world gives, allows us to even be a part in. Lord, we thank you for the cleansing of your blood. And the cleansing of your blood is, is evident today. We pray this, that you will cleanse us from all our unrighteous acts, Lord. Give us um, the power of, of your Son, Jesus, in our life. We're trusting and obeying always in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, after they ate, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup shows the new agreement from God to his people. This new agreement begins with the blood of my death. When you drink this, do it to remember me. goes on to say, every time that you, or we, eat this bread and drink this cup, we show others about the Lord's death until he returns. One other quick note, just to help with the, um, the transition in these times that we find ourselves in, would be that we ask that as you leave after the service, that you would just take your plastic container with your cups. There's a garbage in the back. We are just asking that you dispose of the cups yourself and then just place these plastic trays back on the table so that they can get sanitized for the next time we use them, okay? All right, so in uh, October, of, October 30th, 1938, so just a little bit before my time, Orson Welles delivered a radio broadcast not to be forgotten. On the eve of Halloween, a decision had been made to broadcast a story about an alien attack. The plot was that the Martians had invaded New Jersey. Aliens had come flying in UFOs and had killed dozens of people using a futuristic heat ray. Even though many times they reminded their audience that the show was theatrical, there were a significant number of people that believed the story. Reports came out the next day that many had fled their homes in New Jersey and New York, some with towels across their face because they were concerned about this gas that was supposed to be spewing from the invaders. It was bad enough that an hour after the broadcast, they had to come back on the air and say, guys, this was just fictitious. While the purpose of this broadcast was to have some fun with the audience, not every ideology that gets brought to our attention is harmless. In the 21st century, we have access to a myriad of opinions on every topic at our fingertips. If our lives are not moored to the solid ground that is God's word, it's very easy to be strayed or to stray away from the truth. There is no doubt that we find ourselves in the middle of a battle for our minds. Our passage this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. Again, you can feel free to look it up in your Bible, otherwise it will be printed on the screen. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The Apostle Paul says here that our job is to destroy strongholds. A stronghold is a mental block. 
It's something that keeps us from thinking clearly. Paul is talking about pretensions or arguments that are set up against the knowledge of God. This is a mental battle. And he says, destroy these strongholds. A stronghold can be one of two things. It can be a worldview, materialism, hedonism, Darwinism, communism, atheism. All of these different isms are mental strongholds that people set up against the knowledge of God. But a stronghold can also be a personal attitude. Worry can be a stronghold. Seeking the approval of others. Anything that you make an idol in your life can be a stronghold. Fear, guilt, resentment, insecurity, all of these things can be strongholds in your mind. And the Bible says that we are to tear them down. For those of you that were not here last week, one of the things that I mentioned was I like to try to provide what I call a sermon in a sentence. And so periodically I will mention this again, but I hope that you kind of get used to this being somewhat the norm. And it's to summarize, hopefully, the message to give you a takeaway so that if you should come into contact with people and they ask about the service or you want to broach what you learned in church this week or what was discussed, you can refer back to this. Okay, so this week's sermon in a sentence is, the battle must be won for our minds by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We must be vigilant in our thought life. This morning, I will make four points in order to best prepare us for the battle that we face in our minds. First, the battle for our minds is most effectively fought when we understand the fallen nature of our minds. We naturally feel that if we think something, it must be true because it came to our minds. We're told by our culture to trust our instincts. Go with your heart. Go with what your gut says. But just because you think something doesn't make it true. So many different suggestions come into the mind. The world puts suggestions into our minds that are false. And we're bombarded with those false ideas all the time. And of course, Satan makes suggestions to us as well. The root of our problem is our natural bent towards sin that occurred back in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible uses at least a dozen phrases for the condition of our minds living in sin. See, these are things that you've heard described, especially in our culture. Our minds are confused. Now, our culture says, no, trust your mind. Our minds are anxious. They're closed. Okay, what's the, one of the biggest, we've got to be open-minded. Well, by nature, we are closed-minded people, understand. We're evil. The mind is evil, restless, rash, deluded. The Bible also tells us that we have a, those under sin have a troubled mind, a depraved mind, sinful, dull, blinded, and corrupt. This is our nature. Our minds are broken by sin, which means we cannot totally trust even what we think. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We have an amazing ability to lie to ourselves. You do it all the time. So do I. We lie. We tell ourselves that things aren't as bad as they really are. Or we tell ourselves that things are better than they really are. We tell ourselves we're doing okay, but we know we're not. We tell ourselves it's no big deal when it actually is a big deal. One of the things that showed up in the in our school culture where I taught it, and I see this with adults too, this is not just with kids, but you walk by someone and you ask them how they do, how they're doing, what's their response? 
fine or okay, right? And you've done it yourself probably many times. And many times you walk away thinking that was a lie. You maybe don't say it that way yourself, but it was not truthful. That's why you need to, and I need to, question our own thoughts and teach others not to just believe everything they think. Just because you get a thought doesn't mean it's correct. All sins begin with a lie. The Bible says Satan is the father of lies, and if he can get you to believe a lie, he can get you to sin. Anytime you sin, you're really thinking that you know better than God. God has said, God has said this, but think about the hissing of the serpent in Genesis, but what about that? What if you do this instead? And, and I had a conversation right before church about this, that a lie, a good lie, is never that far away from the truth. Because if it was an obvious lie, we would ignore it. If we say we, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves all the time. A big word also in our culture these days is authenticity. And it's an attractive quality. When you come across someone who's authentic, it's like a bright light shining in a dark world. However, what people don't realize is that in order to really be authentic, we have to be able to admit to ourselves that the majority of the time, we're not authentic. We are inauthentic, inconsistent most of the time. Authenticity begins when we start admitting that we are inauthentic, that we are broken. We all have blind spots. We don't always tell ourselves the truth because we don't often stop to really think. Frequently, we all make snap judgments. We fail to notice important details. We all have more background biases than we realize or are willing to admit. We jump to conclusions. We get trapped by categories. Are you this or are you that? Are you in this category or in that category? Are you with this group of people or this group of people. When we rarely, when there are rarely only two places, two categories, or even three, we miss the big picture. But one of the big reasons you should not just believe everything that you think is that we actually see what we want to see. So one of the things that I like to do uh, once in a while, especially when I was more of the school age, was read about the brain. And so, some of you that are more uh, equipped in that field or in the science field, which I was not a science fan, but you probably, these are things you knew already, but one of the things I learned was that the optic nerve, which is the only nerve that runs directly to your brain, sends more impulses from the brain to the eyes than the eyes to the brain, which means your brain is telling you what to see. You are already preconditioned. That's why you can put four people at an accident and each one of them will tell you something different. We must remind ourselves and teach others not to believe everything we think just because we thought it. Secondly, the battle for our minds is most effectively fought when we stay focused on our true enemy. For followers of Christ, the true enemy is not the person who has wronged us not the person who has chosen an alternative lifestyle, not the supporter of abortion, not the media, and not the person with an opposing political persuasion. These philosophies and positions need to be fought against when they are antithetical to the Bible, but it is not a fight with the person. The true enemy we all face is a spiritual enemy, the devil, because of our sin. There's always something deeper going on, a stumbling block to the unbeliever, something more insidious at work. Something led to these individual groups of people that I mentioned, some belief that brought them to where they are. We need to fight the belief, not the person. And the insidious thing that's at work is the reality that we all live in sin. 
Some of us recognize that we live in sin, and others don't. But this is why believers ought never use personal attacks. We attack with the gospel. It's because of sin that all of humanity is at enmity with God, that can only be reconciled through life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The answer is Jesus, not us. Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to deceive and devour. There is a war going on for our minds, and it's of spiritual nature. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 6, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. These forces are too great for us to handle on our own. We need God to fight for us. Thirdly, the battle for our minds is most effectively fought when we allow God to fight for us. Joshua chapter 1, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And Romans chapter 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? However, somewhere between reading these promises and living them out, sin has a way of getting into our lives and keeping us from truly trusting those promises. I want to bring you back to a, a, a time here in Exodus. So think about all of the things that God did for his people. And I don't have an entire list. This is just a list of some of the kind of the high points of the Exodus. What God did for his people. So he used plagues to help them be able to leave Egypt. He then parted waters for them, that they could cross through to safety to escape Pharaoh's pursuing army. He went ahead of them and fought battles. Perhaps you remember the battle where he told Moses what he had to do was keep his staff raised. And when his staff was raised, his hands were raised, uh, they were winning. And when his arms were tired, they were losing. And so what did Aaron do? He came alongside and he held up his arms. He supported him. But God fought the battles. He then provided daily manna for them when they were out in the desert so that they would not go hungry. He provided water from a rock so that they would not go thirsty. It's hard for me to imagine what more God could give them in order that they would totally trust him. Perhaps you even find yourself thinking, if I was in the boat, I would, I would have definitely trusted him. Be careful about that. When we look at the book of Deuteronomy, if you actually open up to Deuteronomy chapter 1, I don't have to do it right now, but what you find is shortly after these events have occurred that I've described for you, they are, the Israelite people are at the, uh, the base of the, the promised land. They're at Mount, Mount Sinai. And Moses comes before them and says, God has told me this. We are to go to the promised land he has already fought the battle. It is yours. And so, for some reason, out of pride, I assume, trusting in their own knowledge, they decide, no, nah, they don't like that plan. There's Amorites up there. Let's go the strategic route and let's send spies just to make sure. So they go and they send spies up to check out the land. They disobey God and they determine that's what's the best thing to do. Well, God informs them that as a result of this disobedience, none of them from that evil generation, that's what he says, from that evil generation will set foot in the promised land. So it's interesting because now, they, now they've got stake in the game, they've got flesh in the game, they realize this is not good. So they decide, let's, let's go fight. It's time to fight. We should have listened to God the first time. Well, God says, no, nope, I'm not going to be with you this time. What do they do? They disobey again. And they go and fight. And they are defeated. 
What we see here in this kind of overview, this flyover of the story, is two roots of disobedience that showed up in their lives. And while the story may be a little bit different for us, these two uh, issues still rise up in us. First, they didn't trust God. He'd given them everything and more than what they needed, and yet they didn't trust Him. When it came down to the moment, they let their fear overcome their faith. And then secondly, when they realized that they had more flesh in this game, that it was going to impact them in ways, they decided out of arrogance, no, we're going to do this. We're going to ignore you now, even though you're telling us what we don't want to hear. Do you ever find yourself unable to move in faith with God's will because of some distrust? It's kind of a loaded question because if you're like me, my natural tendency is to say, of course not, I trust God. But it's buried down. Underneath it, if we do something against God's will and word, there's distrust there somewhere. Do you ever charge forward full force believing you know what's best out of arrogance? I encourage you to ask God and get alongside mature, other mature Christian accountability and ask them, do they see distrust or arrogance revealing itself in your life? Because as I already stated, I know from personal experience, those things are buried down deep. They are. They're hard to get out. And sometimes, because we have those blind spots, we need other outsiders to help us with that. Okay, last point here. The battle for our minds is most effectively fought when we fight the enemy with the right tools. Okay, I think all of these points are really important. I think this one maybe is the most practical. And then I think hopefully as we go through this, you'll say, yeah, I've been, I've been doing really well at fighting with the tools that God has given us. And no, I fight out of the flesh. So we cannot outwit nor outwar the devil. Satan laughs at our puny attempts to fight him with education, legislation, or just changing our environment. While these are fine in themselves, they don't address the real problem. Battling Satan by improving our environment, for example, would be like battling fire ants by spritzing them with perfume. Ineffective at best. Efforts to reform or strengthen our culture may temporarily improve outward circumstances, but in reality does nothing to address the real battle going on. We have an enemy, and he is real. He wants to control our thought life. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It's important here that we understand what the difference is between being when we're governed by the flesh and when we're governed by the spirit. A few characteristics that are written in Galatians 5 about the mind governed by the flesh is sexual immorality, sensuality, enmity, dissensions, divisions, envy. So when you maybe find yourself fighting or when you see others fighting in the flesh, you should not be surprised when it comes out in bursts of anger or when the argument that the method of trying to attack is to divide people or to, to stir up dissension there should be no surprise when we see people fighting out of the flesh that sexual immorality is used by, by many as a tool to get back at someone this is how we operate in the naturalistic we, if without God we gravitate back to this spirit, or this living within the flesh. Even though people know there's really no positive, if you, if you know someone or if you've experienced those things, uh, you know nothing positive ever comes out of it. And yet, the flesh can be very strong in us. Thankfully, God gave us a better way. Ephesians chapter 6 Paul writes, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, 
And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Truth is what holds everything together. The salvation that we receive from merciful God, that is what should, mind, that should, what should guard our hearts. It is righteousness that our focus should be on in the heart. That we are always prepared to be ready to move in ways to bring peace and reconciliation. That we use faith to deflect the attacks of the enemy and to fight being led by the Spirit. This is a big one. Which is the Word of God rather than our opinions. Use, uh, I'm sorry, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to, inside us to teach us to repent, or for each of us that, who do repent and follow Him. We are not to believe every spirit, but to test them by the Spirit, to know whether they are from God. We are to approve uh, what is excellent and pure and blameless because of the Spirit in us. For it is through this testing, these trials that we find ourselves walking through, where our discernment powers are tested and trained, that we are made mature. So given all that I've said, what does this actually mean practically? What can we do with God's help? What tools has he actually given us from a practical standpoint? Again, this list is not comprehensive, but here are some things that I think are important. If they are not a part of your life, these are good places to start. First, meditate on Bible verses. And I'm not talking about Eastern meditation. This is, you sit down over text, you pray through it, you read through it. You maybe meditate on that even with others around. I think about the Bereans, the Bereans always, about they were approved really by Paul more than anyone because what did they do? They, they meditated on everything that they were taught to test against God's word. Not against what everybody else is telling you. Not against what the world is saying. Not against, not against what you want the text to be saying. Or what someone says to you, go back to scripture. It's got to be our scripture. And in the Psalms, the psalmist says, taste and see what the Lord is good. Guys, we are doing ourselves a major disservice if the majority of our spiritual growth is based off of others' books or just an article here or there that we read online. Those are fine. But if we don't have the Bible as the core and us digging into it ourselves, it is so easy to want to pick up someone else's, you know, uh, Francis Chan is one of my favorites. I love reading his stuff. And yet I'm doing myself a disservice if that is the majority of my study. I need to have my flesh more in the game. Okay, so taste and see. God is so good. He has so much in store. Memorize scripture. Trust in the power of prayer. I have more to say about that. I won't say it today because I'm short on time. But there is so much to be said about the memorizing scripture piece. Trusting in the power of prayer. That God is the one that has authority. Possibly it's removing media or taking part in destructive conversations. That might be something that you know. You know it's taking you down the wrong path. But you know what? I've got to remove this. One of the most powerful Assignments I ever gave to kids in the Bible class I taught years ago, they, they, they hated it at first, because I told them, you've got to take a, a week's time, no media. And ironically, it happened to fall during their spring break, which was even better. Now, I don't know for sure how many of them actually did it, but I know that the ones that did came up to me and said, that is the best assignment we've ever had. It wasn't unique to me, it was something I came up with, but it was because they realized only after removing some of those influences that that was a huge thing. I think maybe the same could be said about just media in general. When we went to Michigan, it was a blessing to kind of be away from that, to be able to sit in some silence away from some of the negative that we hear. 
And the last one, again, I emphasize this again because this is so important. Use scripture rather than your opinions to fight the battle. If you don't know something scripture and you're getting yourself into, you know, if you're getting worked up about whatever your, you know, whatever the taboo subject is that you have, and you don't have scripture to speak, don't say anything. Let it go, cool off, because most likely you're going to make it worse. And so the battle must be won for our minds by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We must be vigilant in our thought life. Finally, whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes internally I feel like I'm in the midst of a battle zone where missiles are falling too close to home. And other times I'm caught in an endless storm, thoughts just completely out of control. Confusion reigns and defeat creeps in in an attempt to steal my joy. I need your peace. That deep kind that stays with me day and night and speaks confidently into the chaos. Call my anxious spirit, Lord, all the attacking if onlys and what ifs. Fill me with needless worry. I know that trust is a big part of experiencing peace and that fear has no place in my life. Most of the things I worry about or dread don't even come to pass. So I'm declaring my trust in you. I'm releasing the reins of my life again and asking you to take control. I may need to pray this prayer again and again, but I am tired of the frenzy of life that leaves my schedule and my thoughts without margin. I need more of you and less of me. I surrender and admit I can't control people, plans, or even all my circumstances. But I can yield those things to you and focus on your goodness. Thank you today for every good gift you've given, every blessing you've sent, all the forgiveness I did not deserve, and yes, every trial you've allowed into my life. You bring good out of every circumstance if only I'll let go and believe. I know that when I pray and give thanks instead of worrying, you have promised that I can experience the kind of peace that passes all understanding. That's your kind of peace. Grant us your peace. Amen. If you would please stand for the benediction, and we are going to, it's not printed in the, we're going to have one other closing song here um, before we leave. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show his favor to you and give you peace. Amen. not on the thing, but we're going to sing the sanctuary song. Mm -hmm.